You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is November 22nd, 2019, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, pharmacology series, Beta Agonists. Our presenter is Dr. Mary Wynn. She's an allergy immunology fellow at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Inflammation 
but then might, we not, might not recognize it because the um, LABA might be masking the clinical effect of inflammation by controlling symptoms and maintaining lung function. And there is a black box warning for um, LABA by itself. Uh, safety use of ICS plus LABA. Uh, they did go over a couple of different studies um, to evaluate the risk difference for LABA versus non-LABA, which showed that there was a risk difference that was um, increased in LABA without the use of ICS compared to trials that um, had mandatory ICS use. Um, Inhaled corticosteroid LABA use didn't increase the risk of asthma-related hospitalization, but did decrease exacerbation and hospitalization compared to just um, inhaled corticosteroid alone. Uh, use of inhaled corticosteroid and long-acting beta agonists as single inhaler maintenance and relief therapy. So this was one of the last things we discussed in the chapter was that the hypothesis was to use the combo inhaler for um, acute um, flares as well as for maintenance therapy. It, the thought is that the additional um, use of inhaled corticosteroid during these acute flare um, can relieve symptoms and provide additional anti-inflammatory benefits to decrease um, frequency of severe deprivation requiring medication um, intervention, reducing the number of oral steroids that we have to give patients, and reducing the um, relief or medication that um, might be needed and also nighttime symptoms, therefore improving lung function. So in conclusion, um, SABA, is, as we know, is one of the most widely used uh, medication for asthma. The tolerance to the bronchoprotective benefit of beta-2 agonists with regular use does exist. Um, regular use as a monotherapy does lead to worsening of asthma control and overuse increases the likelihood of asthma-related death. LABA as a monotherapy increases asthma-related hospitalization and mortality, but the combination of ICS and LABA does improve asthma control. Um, and there is a hypothesis that maybe use of ICS and LABA as a maintenance and a rescue inhaler can reduce the risk of Um, I, I guess it's short that chapter from what it used to be because there used to be lots of charts and graphs in there, um, um, especially listing all the different um, beta agonists that have been used over the years, the ones that are available. Um, I think there's we need to talk about a few of these things. Yeah. Um, um, one is um, the one of the more common ones that was used uh, over the counter for years and years, and it was taken off. It was taken off the market. Now it's back on the market, and something you should all know about um, is inhaled epinephrine, which Mary talked about. Um, I won't say the trade name, but it's been available for years. They took it off the market, I think, when they had um, um, when they switched over to the CFCs, um, um, and um, or I mean, excuse me, from the CFCs to the HFA. Um, and um, but it's recently come back, and, and you it's um, it says it's FDA approved, and it's um, um, and it's available over the counter. The, the problem with that is it's a it's a very short acting product. Um, a lot of people will use it instead of going to the doctor, um, and um, um, they will overuse it. And there was a about oh gosh, fifteen to twenty years ago, there was a. Um, famous supermodel whose sister died um, from basically just puffing on this constantly. And I had um, I had a friend um, who actually used to buy one of these and would just like put it in his mouth and just puff it, you know, multiple times a day, sort of thing. Um, so um, you should be aware of that. Um, you should, you know, if it, um, it's available over the counter. So some people, if they don't want to go to the doctor or they may find it's cheaper than getting something else, they'll they may be purchasing and using it, so you need to know about it and, um, and try to discourage people from um, using it if they have um, significant asthma. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that um, Isopro was another sub uh, product that was used. Um, and when I was a fellow, um, that's also fairly short acting, um, um, or very short acting. Um, when I was a fellow, when we used to do um, testing for reversibility, um, we would give two puffs of an isoprel inhaler, which I'm going to 
sure is even available anymore. Uh, but we used to see two bucks of an isoprel inhaler, and um, you only had to wait five minutes um, for an effect, and um, and we did PFTs, so we got them done a lot quicker. <laughs> um, uh, but it didn't last very long. But um, that was out. I mean, those, that's an old product also that was that, that was that was um, that was out there. Um, the um, when the um, long-acting beta agonist came on board in the 90s. Um, um, the, the first one that was available was Selmeterol. Um, as you know, it's different from um, uh, Formoterol, which is the other commonly one used, um, in that it takes longer to have an effect. Um, the uh, Formoterol um, 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 has, has some bronchodilatory effect um, within 15 minutes or so, where, where um, the um, uh, Selmeterol uh, takes longer. The um, um, they're both formulated to be um, theoretically 12 hours. They're they're twice they're in the products twice a day. But when they first when it first came out, um, they they marketed um, uh, Selmeterol as a separate product. Um, and so you can see how this just to give you an example how things change and and you'll see this stuff and things will come back again they'll change again and you go gosh they did that years ago and they're doing it again and it's what goes around comes around for sure um, but they um, but when it first came out um, we actually used that in the yellow zone so if you had someone who um, was on their controller medicines and they had a yellow zone. So they wouldn't be using albuterol, you know, um, six and eight times a day. Uh, we said, well, what we're going to do well, when they're in the yellow zone, we won't have them use um, albuterol. We'll have them use salmeterol. And they'll just do that so they only have to do it, you know, a couple times a day. Um, and if they're needing it more than that, then they're in the red zone sort of thing. Um, and so we, we did that for quite a long, uh, period of time. Um, and then, as Mary said, there was a, there was a, um, uh, some data that came out that that made that by using a long-acting beta agonist um, on its own, um, and some people that's the other thing that um, when that came out, um, there were it was there was I don't I don't think the I think people made up kind of their own ways of using it and their own kind of guidelines because there were some people who you know and it, like kind of these people that use the um, inhaled up and effort and the, the you get over the counter, some of these people would get um, the cell meter all and they would use that as their only medicine. They go, oh, I just have to use this twice a day. I don't have to take any, any more. I don't want to have to take albuterol so often. And, but they weren't, you know, on an inhaled steroid. They were just using the cell meter all sort of thing. And there were people that were prescribing that, um, and they thought, well, we'll prescribe it because you just occasionally have some wheezing. You can use this, and it'll last for 12 hours if you have a cold. But then people were using it, and then they weren't seeking care for, you know, their repeated symptoms, and they weren't on a controller medicine, and they were getting into trouble. So the, the, some of the data that Mary um, talked about um, were that um, there were studies that suggested that if you were using that um, by itself, basically, um, you were at increased risk of, of of death sort of thing from a bad asthma attack. And in some ways that makes sense if you're not using a controller and you're both just overusing that, that that, that would be the case. The um, 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 the other thing that um, came about about that time was the whole thing with the long acting beta agonist, which started with um, cell meterol, but basically quickly um, included the um, formoterol that came out shortly thereafter because um, they're all in the same class of drugs, was the whole thing about the combination medicines and having a black box warning and increased risk. And a lot of that was based on the single, the single drug stuff data um, 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 because, they, because when um, 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 Salmeterol came out, um, the company decided to do a post-marketing trial or study and they were asking people like if they got if it was prescribed at all, um, if they got it, um, you know, how were they doing with it or something? And then they would ask a question. Then they'd call them back later, and they'd start collecting data. But they didn't. They they really didn't have a lot of data on on um, um, how they were using it, what their background was. They were just looking like did someone do better or worse or something. And they you know they call back and go oh so and so died or something. So they put that down and whatever. And so 
um, they started collecting data that they thought was going to be, you know, helpful for them, and then they started collecting this data that, that there was, and they started analyzing, there was a little difference between, because uh, after a while they decided, well, we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll do another study looking at um, kind of um, um, people with, like placebo effect, the people that get a placebo um, um, drug um, and use that, and we'll see what the effect is. And there was there was um, some difference between, um, um, or there were more people that were on the um, the salmeterol that um, had uh, bad outcomes or died. Um, and the, the when they did the statistics, it was statistically significant. But if you looked at the numbers from the original studies, they they weren't all that. I mean, for the large number of people, they, had, they weren't all that different. Um, but there was enough controversy about all this stuff that they decided that they were going to give it a black box warning, and that included all the um, long-acting beta agonists. Um, and so, um, so until, you know, this past year, we were having to tell people that anytime you prescribed a combination medicine, we had sheets down in the, in the, um, in the, on the wall there. Uh, I don't know how people gave them out, but we were supposed to give them out. But basically, we <coughs> warned people about the that was a black box warning that you let them know as you're prescribing. That was part of your discussion when you're prescribing a, a combination medicine that it had a black box warning. <coughs> here's, here's what the FDA said about it, um, and the whole thing was that if you needed to to use it, if there was someone that already on it and that's the only thing that controlled them, don't pull it off it. Um, but the whole thing was that if you um, were um, um, doing much better, that you considered stepping them down and getting them off the combination medicine sort of thing. Um, now, that had floated out, out there for 15 years or longer. I don't remember what the time is. A long time, anyways, um, that we were doing that. Um, and then finally, the FDA said, well, we want to do a study. And so they required. Um, um, all the companies that made, and there's three major companies that made, or three major products, and companies that made these combination device, um, medicines, they made them do pediatric trials and they made them do adult trials. So we were on, um, 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 so there was, so there were six trials basically with these different products. It was the pediatric indications for them and the adult indications. They had more people in the adult, but they still had thousands of people in, in these each of these studies. And these were this was a global thing, so it wasn't only in the United States, but they also um, recruited from from around the world. And we were part of two of the studies here, our own little clinical research people. Um, um, we did um, one of the pediatric trials, then we did one that was like you know 12 and above sort of thing um, to add to that data. But basically, when they did all this data about safety and stuff, they basically found out that there there really wasn't any significant safety issues. So no one ever thought that, even when that data came out, no one ever thought that the FDA would, would, would take the black box warning off, but they did. And so that was, in, I believe, in the last year or so, they took that black box warning off. Um, so um, that all, that hopefully gives you some little historical background about this stuff, because you'll, um, you know, um, just like this um, inhaled epinephrine, um, you know, I saw that as a kid, um, and, um, and it was and there was controversy about it when I was in, in medical school and as a resident and stuff. And then, you know, it was gone for a while, and now it's back again sort of thing. So, um, um, and, um, you know, it may come down the road that somebody later on does some other studies that, oh, no, I think there is some data that shows such and such is a problem or something and tries to join something again. But the, the study with the long-acting beta agonist and the, and the inhaled steroid, um, um, you know, um, that included thousands of people from around the world, and so it was a, a very comprehensive. So I, I think that data is pretty sound. Um, um, there was something else I was going to mention. Um, I can't think what it was. Maybe that I think salmeterol, since it's a later onset of action, we don't really use it for smart therapy or dynamic dosing because you don't get that immediate relief like you do with the formodal. Yeah. Um, those are some other things. Um, you know, we, we can talk a little bit about dynamic dosing as well. But the, um, um, that was one of the things that um, um, people didn't like about um, salmeterol 
um, when they got it because they were expecting they'd get this old buzz like they do with albuterol, and they weren't getting that. They feel something, you know, and they weren't getting it, and it took longer or something. And so, um, so there were a lot of people that didn't think it was working because they didn't have that immediate effect. You had to, you had to tell them it's not going to be in 15 minutes. You're going to feel something, you know. Um, and um, so that's all education part of the stuff. The other thing is that, um, and um, you were part, didn't you, one of those people that wrote this, um, dynamic dosing? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I um, asked that. <laughs> the, um, um, the, um, going back to what Mary said about the, the single long-acting beta agonist, there was data, as Mary referred to, that showed that um, if you um, if you um, used a long-acting beta agonist with an inhaled steroid, the two and you used them together, there was a sort of protective effect for, on the lungs, and it actually had you know it was an additive effect for the for the effect of the medicine. But it was um, but you kind of negated this like um, this negative effect that they were concerned about with the with just using it alone. Um, and so then, you know, they, they took um, um, salmeterol as a single product that went off the market. I, I still, I think it's still off the market, or off the market. But they, but it was a, it was available for a long time as a single product, um, and, and less and less people were prescribing it. Um, but um, the, uh, um, but but part of that was that um, again, it was there was concerns about safety if you're just using it by itself. Um, and there was a protective about, about the two of them. So part of that that whole idea of the of them working together and having a protective effect came up with, with dynamic dosing because, um, and again, this is what goes around comes around. I remember when I was a resident and when I was a fellow that there were these you know old time docs um, that that would have their patients before they used their um, their um, their inhaled steroid would always have them use albuterol before they use their inhaled steroid. Always, always, always. So you'd ask them, like, how many times do you use albuterol? Oh, I use it four times a day. You use it four times a day? Yeah, I use it before I take my... Because when I started out as a, as a fellow, um, um, your inhaled steroids um, were four times a day. All of them were four times a day. Um, so the, um, the precursor to Flovent was, um, or Fluticazone was, um, beclomethazone, um, which is now in another product that's been changed, but the um, 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 but that was four times a day, and you used to do two plus four times a day. Um, the, um, yeah, all that stuff was four times a day, and then they came out with um, a product um, that was twice a day. Um, however, it had a nasty taste, and so then they added menthol to it, which made it like a nasty taste with menthol, um, <laughs> and um, but that was twice a day. That was so you know the thing is that they thought, well that'll be a revolution because you don't have to take it twice a day. But it was so bad, but it wasn't taken. <laughs> um, um, that's my own that's my own uh, private opinion. If the you know if, <laughs> if I don't get in trouble here, um, um, but the the whole thing with dynamic dosing is taking uh, taking. Um, you know, um, the, 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 the old primary care doctors and old doctors when I was a, I call them old doctors, when I was a, um, um, a fellow were that, you know, basically you take the albuterol first because it opens up your way so you can get more of that inhaled steroid down into your lungs to be more beneficial, to get them down farther in the smaller airways and all that sort of stuff. Um, um, so, um, you know, we, we do dynamic dosing. The dynamic dosing that, that most people are familiar with is using, using formoterol um, because it, it, it kicks in within 15 minutes. And it's less longer. I, I believe it's like eight hours, isn't it, for formoterol? Four. Um, how long it lasts? For, yeah. I think so, like half-life life. Um, but the, you know, um, but there's, I mean, it's still, it's still prescribed in the products twice a day um, is the thing. The... Um, um, there is at least one pharmaceutical company, because I talked with one of their medical liaisons yesterday, that's that's developing a um, a short-acting beta agonist with a um, inhaled steroid, um, a combo medicine. And this has been talked about for a long time. And I don't know if there's more than one company, but I know there's at least one company doing that. Um, and so, um, 
So, for, for example, um, we have a lot of people that use fluticasone. Um, and so if they were, um, 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 you know, if you're using fluticasone as opposed to, um, they don't need to be on a, a combination medicine per se. Um, um, but, you know, um, there would be people that you could say, okay, you, every time you use, um, um, you know, if you have the combo medicine, so every time you're using the fluticasone, you're using it twice a day, you're getting um, some, um, like, albuterol with it. Um, and then um, if you're going to um, eat albuterol uh, in your yellow zone, every time you're using albuterol, basically you're taking a couple puffs of, of fluticasone. We also know that by the pharmacokinetics of the drug that giving two puffs four times a day is superior to giving four puffs twice a day because of the, the, the um, bioavailability and the, and the pharmacology of the drugs. Um, it's a hassle because people don't want to do something uh, four times a day. But if you, if you link it to when they need the albuterol or the, the rescue medicine, um, then every time they would use that, they would, they would also be getting um, two posts of albuterol, or two posts of like, um, an inhaled steroid. Um, so, um, so if someone's having an exacerbation, they're probably using the albuterol three or four times a day, maybe even more. But so if you say, well, you're using it, if you're using it uh, more than four times a day, just like if you're needing albuterol more than four times a day, you're probably going to put them in the, in the red zone. So, um, so um, it would it would be interesting to, um, and I don't know, maybe mainly in those days, uh, if they if they uh, if they did head-to-head -head studies where they actually did dynamic dosing with a um, um, with a short-acting beta agonist and compare that to doing like we traditionally done is like doubling or quadrupling, um, you know, the inhaled steroids in the yellow zone and see what the efficacy is. Um, the thing that, um, that um, uh, I guess always kind of bothers me about the, when we talk, we did one of these studies recently and I've seen it at the meet, it was, they've talked about it at the meeting as, and, and um, that we went to in Houston as well, um, is that, um, that one of the studies that, that um, debunks using or doubling or quadrupling um, inhaled steroids um, was using um, fluticasone 44, and these were for older kids and, and stuff, and I never used that in that age, and so I'm not quite sure what the severity of that asthma was and do they really need all that stuff, um, and, you know, was that going to make much of a difference? I think it would probably be more um, important to people that um, had more significant disease that needed to be on more inhaled steroids to control their symptoms. Um, so um, there's 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 still a lot out there. We you know in our own institution have have differences be, between allergy and pulmonary about you know how to you know is there a yellow zone how to how, what to treat with the yellow zone all that sort of stuff. And um, this is all an evolving process. And as I said, um, it will evolve, and somebody will come up with a new standard, and then, uh, and then you know, five or six years later, then they go, no, that's all, that doesn't work, or whatever, that's not good, and we're going to, um, you know, evolve it again, sort of thing. And you may see some of these things go back to stuff that you did when you were a resident or a fellow years from now, and you go, well, we used to do that when I was a fellow. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so it, it, all of this, all this stuff will be interesting. But um, I, I, I like the personally, I like the concept of of um, using a short acting beta agonist, um, you know, with in you know, like in your yellow zone or red zone, using it with um, an inhaled steroid. So the so, but the thing is, um, you know, trying to get them to do both at the same time, I think, is problematic. Um, I also want to put it on a plug in that, um, you know. Um, uh, there's, you know, I know you people look at data and you know and and such, um, but um, you know I've been doing this for quite some time, and um, we had uh, before we gave asthma action plans and before we, uh, you know, identified yellows and stuff, we had people that were um, that had lots of problems with their asthma were were overusing the system. We used to have a monthly meeting because we had so many. Um, of high flyers, we used to have a monthly meeting with the with the emergency room, pulmonary, allergy, the the hospital 
um, um, insurance people and all this stuff, basically reviewing high flyers and basically trying to find out what we could do to intervene so they wouldn't be keep, keep coming to the emergency room or keep being admitted all the time. And I mean, these were large number of people that we were having, that we were talking about each month that we were doing on monthly to try to identify these things. And then we started, um, you know, instituting asthma action plans and being more aggressive and following patients and giving them plans. Um, and my gestalt has been we have a we we also have had historically a lot of people who have had asthma who have had medicines but really never had a plan or how to how to how to do anything with their medicines when they were sick. Um, and my own feeling is that that there's lots of patients out there that we gave asthma action plans to and doubled or quadrupled or whatever their inhaled steroids. Um, that did well when they had a flare, that they didn't go into the red zone, that they didn't, they had less emergency room visits and such. Um, and when we first started doing this years ago, um, Dr. Portnoy uh, was kept track of a lot of this data, and he was able to show that, that we were decreasing ER visits and hospitalizations for these, these patients. Um, so um, I, I, I guess my, my plug is don't ever think that because someone does a study that, that something that's been done is entirely bad or is, or is worthless because, um, um, you know, this is one, you know, you have one or two studies and, and, and any time you do a study, it's, it's sort of artificial because you're, you're forcing people to do certain things that aren't going to necessarily be what real life is. So, um, so I think you should take all that stuff with a grain of salt. And when you review these studies um, and you do some of these things with your own patient, your own patients, you have to look at, you know, do you think that they're doing better? There may be all this data out there, but you have to look at your own patients if you implement some of this stuff and see if it's working or not working in your patients. If it's not, then you need to go back to the drawing board. So, anyways. So I stretched that, Mary, a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been around for a while. Um, no, I, the, 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 I, didn't go through the chapter, but the, historically they had lots of charts where they went through all the different, the, historically through the different beta agonists and all the controversies about the beta agonists and all that stuff, and they, and they spent a long time in that. So I just think you guys need to have some background in that at least. Um, so do you want to, since we have a few minutes, do you want to talk to us about, about dynamic dosing? I can. Okay. <laughs> It's been a while, though, but, I mean, it basically goes to the concept of just because now our long-acting beta agonist is so quick-acting with the formoterol that you get that benefit right away, and you're giving the steroid at the same time. So, like, as we double, as you talked about, double uh, ICS, it's basically doing the same thing when you need it. Um, and what they've actually shown, there was a big meta-analysis, I think, maybe just a year or two ago, where they actually showed that there was decreased exacerbation, decreased ER visits, and actually overall decrease in uh, use of inhaler, so inhaler use, because you're just using it when you need it. Um, so those were all positives in it. The thing it didn't show, there was no difference from change in uh, PFTs or, um, and I guess also the side effect profiles were like less too, like, you know, the thing with height, which is, I know, debatable. But so overall, it was using less medications, getting less exacerbations, and so overall, it showed that it was a benefit, basically, just by doing it by dynamic dosing, which is once again just really using it when you need it. So. Well, I mean, the um, my impression is from what Dr. Porter had said that the that um, you know using a combination medicine like formoterol, that they're using that um, as a single medicine, so Correct. they don't have. Um, they don't have al they don't have albuterol, um, you know, as a rescue. Um, now the other problem is that the um, there's been concerns about people overusing the the long acting beta agonists because they're formulated to be you know what's on average 12 hours or something. So what's the effect of having someone you know using that inhaler um, six times a day when it's not supposed to be more than twice a day? And that's one of the things that um, I think it's confusing to people when you um, when you um, um, talk to them about dynamic dosing, and then you go home at night and you have the television commercial on for um, for these um, combination medicines, which um, which compete with all the biologics that they want you to go talk to your doctor about. Um, but they all all of them say you should never use it more than twice a day. Um, 
and that was one of the things that was a concern um, with the safety issues is that if you, about you know you're um, you're not supposed to be doubling those. So people that was one of the things that people talked about when people started doubling inhaled steroids. You can't they shouldn't be doubling um, inhaled steroids with a combination medicine because you're also getting all this extra beta agonists. And because going back to the single use beta agonist stuff, there was concern that that would that would increase toxicity or side effects or or bad outcomes or whatever. But that's why the hope was that since now they got it removed for the combination, the black box warning, that maybe we can get like smart or dynamic dosing basically approved by the FBA. Yeah. That that was the hope. But the the other thing would be is like um, is there um, is there an advantage to giving someone a medicine that's supposed to last for twelve hours, let's say, um, and so you should take twice a day, giving them uh, you know you know, doubling or quadrupling that amount of beta agonists, and is there going to be any uh, side effects from that, or any long-term um, side effects from that? Um, I don't think I remember seeing anything for long-term side effects um, when we looked through the data off the top of my head. Like the, but, how, but when they looked at the data, was this say uh, the 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 other part goes? Is this a study where they they said? Oh yeah, you can do dynamic dosing, and you can do you can use for model up to three times a day if you need it. Then go to be, be put on prednisolone or something like prednisone or something, as opposed to someone in real life who has that inhaler and said, "Hey, they said I'm, I'm using this just like my rescue inhaler. Well, I'm needing my rescue inhaler six times a day because I'm having an exacerbation, so I'm using for model six times a day in that dose. And is there is there an effect from you know stimulating your beta agonist that much, you know?" Kind kind of go back to like you know overdosing on epinephrine or something you know, um, so um, that that's always been a concern of mine because you know, I don't know what that data is. Maybe there's data out there that shows that you know you can give it eight times a day and it's you know it doesn't really cause any problems. I haven't seen that data. I think okay. it'll be especially interesting to see how like the new GINA guidelines for intermittent asthma recommending the ICS lava yeah. as needed for intermittent asthmatics. You know. The education about how often, how much you can use, I think, like it's Would be not very. Yeah, it's interesting to see. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out because I don't think there's many people who feel super comfortable with that just yet. Obviously, also not FDA approved here. So, um, but incorporating those guidelines, or if we will, is, will be interesting to watch. Does everyone feel like if like the combination inhalers, whenever there's a yellow zone, we're telling them to add just the. Uh, yes, there's still some nervous about, hey, yeah, you can just double up on the combo. It depends who. I mean, I've, you've seen our plans where we'll go up to TID basically dosing, mm -hmm. and then if you go over that, then you go to red zone. Mm -hmm. That's how and I've seen it. some people that um, have done that where they did it. I think, I think in the past, I think maybe when Dr. Corner did, did it, but they did it four times a day. Yep, I've seen know? that too. Um, and <laughs> so, but the, again, you know, our... our patient population, or any patient population, you're going to have people that are going to kind of do what they want, and they say, well, you know, this usually helps me, and you know, I'm having a bad exacerbation, so I guess I'll use it a couple more times and just say, you know, whatever, and they, uh, my concern is that they may not start the red zone when they have to, or, um, you know, there's uh, there's concerns about that. So, and then the other thing is that there's um, concerns about regular use um, um, beta agonists, because um, in, in patients like who have exercise-induced asthma, because there are studies that show that you have le you have um, um, tachyphylaxis. Yeah, you get it like tachyphylaxis. I'm trying to remember this. Is it that you you have an effect, but it doesn't last as long? Um, so um, so if you're using those um, regularly, and that goes back with the well, that exercise-induced asthma and bronchospasm literature. Um, so, so if someone's using, you know, a long-acting beta agonist, you know, three or four times a day, um, is that is that causing any tachyphylaxis? Let's say, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if those studies have been done. I, I just remember when they talked about the profiles and the adverse events. I didn't think they even mentioned that, actually, in the paper. You know, I wonder if things. anybody's even looked at it. Yeah, good point. No. I don't. Not that yeah. I know. No. Aware of. Can ask Dr. Portnoy. Nope. And, and my microphone is really bad, so I won't do much talking. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Wait. Yeah. Um, 
Jan, I don't know if you can get a quick response, but do you know that if there's any evidence of, of tachyphylaxis to long-acting beta agonists when you use them in dynamic dosing? There was a lot of concern about that, but it hasn't really been reported. As long as you're using it with the inhaled steroid, it doesn't seem to be a problem. They looked at that when they started using cell meterol with cuticazone. That was a big concern, but it just hasn't been reported. Do you know if anybody's looked at it specifically? I think they did initially. I remember some studies looking specifically. I know with, uh, with, um, with um, cell meterol. But I, don't, I didn't know about with formoterol if there was anything. Yeah, I don't know. You have to look at okay. it. Okay. Well, um, I think we'll end it there unless someone has any other concerns or wants to talk about beta agonist and give some recollections of some good times they had with beta agonist. <laughs> <laughs> when it was oral? <laughs> They're like oral. Oh, oh yeah. I forgot, <laughs> I forgot that. Okay. I forgot that. I forgot that. We used to, we actually had oral um, yep. um, beta agonists that were available, and they actually had a pill um, that we used in, in, into the 90s um, that you could give twice a day, um, and um, we actually would use it in patients who had nighttime, who had more nighttime symptoms. We would just add that on. We'd give them the pill that they would take at nighttime. And by the time it absorbs, is probably while they're asleep. Yeah. That's a smart idea. So, and that kind of went away. The other thing that I um, am, am, uh, have always um, been um, upset with one of the big pharmaceutical companies, one of the big pharmaceutical companies um, had an albuterol um, preparation that was a dry powder that came in this little device that was two pieces of plastic. It had a little capsule. You put in a little slot in it, you twisted it, broke the capsule, you sucked it up in this little, like whistle device, and you could hear it spinning around, and you could check to see if you got the medicine, because you could open it up and you could see that it was, the powder was gone. The capsule was there, but the powder was gone. Um, it was almost indestructible. It was hard plastic, two pieces, so it, wasn't, it, was, it was very hard to damage. It came in its own little hardcover carrying case that fit in a shirt pocket or put in the back of your pants. No spacer was needed. It even had in the little box that had a little a little um, um, bottle that you could put you know a number of, of capsules in. Each capsule was equivalent to two puffs of albuterol. Um, no harm to the ozone layer <laughs> at all. You know, decrease the carbon footprint and all those good things. And um, and they, they basically took this off the market, at least in the United States, um, 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 just prior to all the stuff with the CFCs, and, which I thought was unfortunate. The thing that was nice is we, that we used it mostly was in teenagers because teenagers don't want to carry spacers or use them. They didn't have to. The other thing is that we had some teenagers who were overusing their um, um, albuterol, and they would, you know, do they just put it in their mouth to be pop, 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 pop. We had we had a couple kids I remember that were doing like like 16 and 18 puffs a day, and they're going through inhalers, and the pharmacy is calling us like every week or 10 days or something. They're wanting another refill of it or something. And so um, the thing that was nice is you could the the you know a parent could actually dole out the number of capsules that they put in the in the in the bottle that they had their little thing they carried with them and so you could or you could keep track of how many they're using sort of thing by that um, but it was a great little device where studies show that it worked just as well as the inhaler with the spacer um, and they took it off the market and it, the, the canister back the canister is reusable I'm guessing and you just bought the pills is that yeah oh the, no it's a pla it's a, like a plastic device. If anybody's used um, uh, Foradil, because um, they had the uh, 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 Formoterol, um, I think it's still available as a single um, um, medicine. It had a, it had a device because my dad had it. Um, as, well, he he died like about nine years ago, but he he was using it until he died. Um, they wouldn't they wouldn't um, he was getting his medicines through the VA, and they wouldn't um, approve the combination medicine, but they would give them both medicines separately. And the, um, uh, the Formoterol, which I think is Foradil, um, had this little device like we used to use with Chromalin, where you put the capsule and you had, you had to like twist it. It was this plastic device that broke easily. My dad went through about four of those things. Have you ever used those? 
Not personally, but I've prescribed them, yes. Yeah, and they, they're just this flimsy plastic that broke you. The, 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 um, um, the dry powder and stuff had two hard pieces of plastic. It's literally about this <laughs> big, and it looked like like a, like a fat whistle sort of thing, but it had the two pieces just put together and just kind of, you just kind of turned. And when you turn it, you just, you put the, it's like a little slot for the, for the capsule, just turn it, and it would just, it would bust the capsule, and you just put up your mouth and go, and the other, the other that had like a, like a, a grill on it. And, um, I mean, it was very hard plastic. I mean, you'd have to like, you'd have to like stomp on it a bunch of times to get it to break. Um, and, and it also came with this little carrying case, this little hard shell plastic case that fit in your pocket, you know. So, so for women, they like to, teenage girls like could put it in the purse, and guys could put it in their pocket or even their jean pocket and carry it around without having a worry about a spacer. So, so it's discontinued in 2015. So when I what that's Ford, 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 yeah, so not because of safety, but for like because of money, <laughs> basically. <laughs> it was yeah. It's they're not going to make as much, and they yeah, don't have to sell the yeah. inhaler. Yeah, yeah, people aren't. Um, but it was this weird device with the <laughs> with a capsule thing that you you twist it and it will break very easily. And then, especially if you have elderly people trying to use that thing. And my dad, as I said, he broke it at least four times that I know of that he had to get a new one. So it made um, me wonder about it because I was at the VM. Like, why why would I have never prescribed it? Because they would keep the same formulary. Mostly. Yeah, they would whatever the. Yeah, we had combo by then. We had a lot of doctors, uh, not a lot, but definitely some commu um, some docs when I was a hospitalist who were still giving oral albuterol to their uh, oh. patients. I've not seen that. Yeah. So. Well, you can, there's the, there used to be a liquid um, that people would give um, um, that basically was worthless, and then they had the, but they had a, they actually had a, they actually the, I can't remember what the pill was called. But they had a pill that you could take, and there was actually a small study, and I think Hal Nelson was part of that. This was back in, like, the 90s. It was a small study that was done that, um, that showed adding um, the, um, the albuterol tablet to an inhaled steroid was um, 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 fairly equivalent to having a long-acting beta agonist um, added to the inhaled steroid. Um, it was just a small little study that I think that maybe, I don't know who did it, but I think Kel Nelson was associated with it. For some reason, it just comes to my mind. Maybe not. But um, that showed that it was effective. So we would, um, um, we tried that for some people that were, again, were having more nighttime symptoms. We'd give them, we'd just add the, the tablet at nighttime. Um, but again, all these things, but there was evidence that that actually worked as opposed to the liquid stuff. Because when I went, when I was working in the public health service, um, in uh, um, in South Dakota and then in Appalachia, um, I can't tell you the number of people. Most people had liquid liquid albuterol. They didn't use inhalers. It was mm -hmm. liquid albuterol or nebulizers. It was just a, well, because you didn't have you didn't have refrigeration. You didn't have to worry about electricity or anything. You just had a bottle. You just you know took something, but it didn't really do anything. Oh, well. Because it wasn't doing anything. Plus, it's going to be cost because if you can just give a pill, it's going to be cheaper than selling the whole inhaler. So they're going to make more money selling the inhaler and the inhaler technology. Yeah, <laughs> but it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't very effective at all. I don't know what the the initial data was, but it wasn't. I mean, all these kids that I saw didn't really ever help them. So it didn't help the adults I talked to either. But. Okay. I guess we stretched that quite a bit, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, 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 we're going to end COLA there this morning, um, and uh, you all have a good weekend. <laughs>